Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we're taking a look today at a pretty cool battery-powered touch display from a company called Pepper Jobs. This is the Extend Touch 1610F V3, and this has a ton of neat features depending on what you have plugged into it. So for example, right now I've got my Nintendo Switch plugged in, and we're able to get its video output to the display without the need for a dock. But there's a lot of other cool stuff on this one as well, including the ability to use it as a touch screen with a Mac. So we're going to try out a whole bunch of different devices today. But before we get into this, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this was sent to the channel free of charge from Pepper Jobs. However, they are not paying for this review, nor are they reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded, and all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see what this display is all about. Now, the price point on this comes in at around $329. You can certainly find other portable displays that cost less than this one out there, but Pepper Jobs, I found over the years, puts a lot more engineering and quality into their products. We have looked at a bunch of stuff that they've manufactured in the past, including a mini PC that performed better than all the other mini PCs it was competing with out there, along with a really cool TV remote and other accessory items. They do go above and beyond. They don't just pump out some generic stuff. And you'll see as we work through the feature set here that this one certainly uh, follows in that tradition. Now, this is a 15.6 inch IPS display. It is running at a 1080p resolution and you get about 300 nits of brightness at its full brightness level. Now, if you are running on battery, you'll get about five or six hours of battery life out of the display, provided you keep the brightness at about 65% of its maximum. If the battery runs out, what it will do is draw power from the host device if it's able to do that. I don't think the switch can provide that power, but a laptop, for example, probably will if it's plugged in via a USB Type-C port. So the useful length of time will vary based on device, but there are a lot of different ways that you can make use of this display to maximize it. And of course, you can plug the display in either to a USB power source that's plugged into the wall or to an external USB battery to extend it out further. Now, this is not going to be something I'll recommend for hardcore gamers because it maxes out at 60 hertz. The input latency is about what you would typically see with one of these portable displays, not as good as a gaming display might be. There's no game mode on this one either to speed it up. It's not bad, I'm not detecting a lot of input lag, but it feels about on par with projectors and other portable display devices that I have tested. Now this is not gonna be a display that you use for professional video grading or photo editing because it only covers about 72% of the NTSC color gamut and it runs at a 700 to one contrast ratio. The response rate is 14 milliseconds, and even though that is a bit on the higher side, especially for gaming, I'm not seeing all that much image blur as you're playing fast motion games like this one. So overall, for casual use, I think it is fine and is certainly on par or better than many of the other similar portable displays I've looked at over the years. Now this has a ton of connectivity options and pretty much anything that will connect over HDMI or USB Type-C will work with it. So on the left-hand side here, you can see we have two USB Type-C ports. The ideal use case would be to plug power into one of those ports. It does come with a 15-watt USB-C adapter and cable. And then the other port I would use for plugging in your switch or your laptop or something like that. Then you can have it kind of run indefinitely uh, with that power source. But you also get a full-size HDMI plug here. And that's great, so you don't have to walk around with some micro or mini cable. You can actually just use a regular HDMI cable to plug right into it. And in a few minutes, we'll plug in a Google Chromecast so you can see how that all works. Additionally, you've got a headphone jack here, but there are stereo speakers built in, one on either side of the unit here. They actually sound pretty good for a little speaker, but of course, it'll sound better with headphones. The audio comes into the display from the USB-C or the HDMI output. There is no other analog audio input. I'm not seeing any Visa mounts here on the back, but of course it does come with the stand and cover combo that I'll show you in a second. On the other side, you've got a USB-A port, and this is a USB OTG port. So if you have one of these portable keyboards with the dongle, you can plug the dongle into the port 
and have the keyboard work through the single connection back to the computer. And that's another thing we'll demo in a few minutes here. This is your power button, and then you've got a multi-function switch that can adjust things as you're setting things up on the display. And I'll show you that as well when we get everything hooked up. With the stand here, this comes in at around 1.5 kilograms or 3.3 pounds. It is a bit on the heavier side, but again, you've got a big battery in here and a pretty robust feature set, so there are some compromises on the weight. But it feels very nicely constructed. The glass on the front has a nice thickness to it, and it's got an anti-fingerprint coating on it as well, so it does look and feel a lot nicer than some of the generic stuff out there. Now, like other portable displays, the cover doubles as the stand. So right now, of course, we have it covering the display, and then I can open it up here and have it work as a stand. It works okay. It seems to hold together pretty well, but if you give it a really hard push, of course, that will impact things a bit. I would have preferred to have had a built-in kickstand, especially given the thickness here, but it does work and the cover seems to provide decent enough protection for the display when you're on the go. Now you'll notice my switch is getting a charge here while it's plugged into the display, even though we don't have a dock attached. And that's because this will provide a small amount of power to the host device that's providing the video, but it's only five volts at one amp, which is the equivalent of a very slow cell phone charger, for example. And the switch and other devices certainly need more power than that to operate. So if you're playing a game, you're going to see the Switch's battery deplete at around the same rate it would if you were playing handheld. The way around that, of course, is to dock the Switch into a dock with its own power supply and then run HDMI video to the display here. This will also impact the battery life of the display, so you'll knock about an hour or so off the overall battery life if you're plugging in a device that is drawing power from the display's battery when it's plugged in. Now, one more note on switch compatibility. The Switch Lite does not output video, even though it has a USB-C port. So the only switches that will work with this display are the ones that come with a dock, like my original one here, along with the newer OLED model. All right, let's take a look at a few other things. I've got my Windows PC plugged in right now over a USB-C connection, and I have my keyboard's dongle plugged into that USB-A port that we were looking at before. And as you can see, I'm able to interact with this device with the USB plugged into the display. I can also, of course, use my fingers like I would be able to use on a regular Windows touchscreen, so it's fully Windows compatible. I have a neat little tester app here that will show us uh, exactly how compatible it is with multi-touch here. So you can see I've got all uh, 10 multi-touch points here being picked up by the display on Windows. So very compatible with Windows devices, even if the host device you're plugging into does not have a touch display built in. Now, if you push the button here, you'll get the on-screen display to come up. And what's nice about this is that it operates with touch as opposed to having to navigate with buttons and stuff. So I could switch inputs, for example. I could switch over to the HDMI if I had something else attached. I can adjust the color standard that it's using. So right now it's set to standard but I could also go over to sRGB, DCI P3, Adobe RGB, and Rec 220 based on what I have set up on my host device. Now this also supports HDR and you can enable that feature in this menu, but I found the HDR doesn't look all that much different than the standard dynamic range, so I think it's doing more of a mapping as opposed to impacting the overall dynamic range of the image quality. Another thing that I like here is I can adjust the brightness just by dragging my finger up and down, and the same is true of the volume on the speakers. So it's very easy to interact with the uh, OSD here, more so than it might be on other displays where you've got to push all these crazy buttons to get it to respond to stuff, and then you can just hit the exit button there to hide the menu away. All right, now I've got my MacBook Air plugged in, and as many of you know, Macs typically don't support touch displays, but this will actually emulate a magic trackpad, including all of the gestures that you can do with it. So at a minimum here, I can just drag my window around here like I was using a magic trackpad just by uh, touching the display, very similar to what we just did on Windows. And it also supports the gestures that the magic trackpad supports. So I can do a pinch to zoom here. I can scroll around the image with a two finger scroll. I can do my four finger swipe up to switch between applications. So most of the gestures here work, and they center themselves around where you put the mouse pointer, because of course this display has a much larger surface area than a Mac trackpad does. 
So it will base your gestures off of where you center the mouse pointer. So if you're not getting a lot of results with it initially, just tap where you want the center to be and then have at it. But it's really cool to see this functionality added to a Mac because again, Macs don't support touch displays natively. Now I've plugged in a Samsung phone here that supports DeX and sure enough, it works here on the display. No issue with the touch here. It just comes right up and functions like you would expect it to. What's also nice is that my keyboard dongle is working here too. So I can uh, type on my keyboard with that dongle attached to the display here and have it work over OTG. So it is a functional uh, DeX device here that's pretty much plug and play. Now, if you have an iPad with a USB Type-C connector, it will output video, but the touch functionality is not quite there. So as you know, uh, the iPad does support magic trackpads and other mouse devices, but as you can see here, the mouse pointer doesn't quite work very well. But some gestures do work. So for example, I can scroll my screen here with two fingers and move back and forth. So there is some limited touch functionality, but for the most part, this is going to be mostly a display output. However, the OTG support with the USB there does work. So you can use your keyboard and mouse combos with this and have them work like they did on the other platforms. Now, as we continue our lightning round here, I thought I would plug in the Steam Deck and see what happens. This, of course, is a uh, device running with a customized version of Linux for gaming. And if I plug in my USB-C cable, you will see the Steam Deck will give us a warning about the charger being too slow. That's that uh, five volt, one amp thing we talked about earlier. But check this out, the touch works on it, no problem. So you can get that touch functionality to work here on the Steam Deck using this display without any drivers. It's just plug and play. So I thought that was a nice surprise. Now just one note on the Steam Deck, like the Switch, it only has a single USB-C port and you're not gonna get enough power out of the display to charge it while you're playing games. So you will need to get a USB-C dock for it to work with its own power source. And that of course will eliminate the touch compatibility because your video will be coming through the HDMI versus the USB-C. But the HDMI does work quite well. And as you can see here, we've got my uh, Google Chromecast attached here and I'm able to use that actually powered by the display. So what we're doing here is running the USB-C port into the Chromecast for power, and then its HDMI cable is plugged into the HDMI port here. And because I still have the USB dongle attached, I get my mouse functionality here over OTG. So you can use a keyboard with it like we were on the other platforms, but of course the touch here does not work. And if we jump into Netflix on the Chromecast, you'll see that it does detect the HDR video capabilities of the display. It's showing HDR here, and I can go ahead and play this back and have this HDR video play back properly on this display. Like I mentioned at the outset, the image quality isn't all that much better than just watching a, a standard dynamic range video, but it is properly mapping the colors here, and it looks pretty good for a 1080p display. The HDR is enabled inside of the menu here. If you go over to image and HDR and have it set to auto, it will auto detect when a device is requesting HDR video. So overall, I found this to be a very flexible display that works with just about everything and has a few nice surprises built in like the MacBook Magic Trackpad emulation. You've got a lot of different display connectivity options here and everything that I've plugged into it just works, which is great. And of course, you've got, I think, pretty usable battery life if you wanted to go uh, out in the field without a power source. So altogether, for a portable display here, this is a nice one that uh, should give you a ton of flexibility for all the different things that you might need to plug into it. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month.
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.